Hi, and welcome back to Fundamentals of Bioinformatics. This is part one of the microbiome analysis methods section. There's a lot we could cover on the topic of microbiome, uh, bioinformatics, and microbiome analysis methods. Uh, and in these lectures, we're going to focus on what I think of as the downstream components of this analysis. And so I'll define a little bit about um, you know, what I mean by that as we jump in. Um, as a result, I'm going to kind of quickly move through the upstream components of an, of an analysis. Um, and so um, we're going to move through some stuff pretty quick. I'm going to point out how it relates to things that we've covered already throughout the course of this semester. And then we'll dive in detail into some of the um, ways that we actually um, gain biological insights about, my, uh, about microbiomes. Um, these, this segment of the course will be a bit different than what we have done up till this point. Um, up till this point, we have really been focusing on individual components um, or uh, individual components of analyses. So things like um, doing sequence alignments or applying a machine learning method. Um, and so I really think of that as sort of the um, fundamental topics. And what we're getting into now is applications of bioinformatics. And so you'll see that as we go through these next few lectures, I'm going to be pulling little bits and pieces of things that we've talked about up until this point into the lectures. And so we'll be integrating a lot of the ideas that we've explored earlier to perform, to think about how we would um, apply that to perform an analysis of a microbiome. So let's jump in with um, a quick overview of how uh, this gets started. Um, so in a microbiome survey, you will typically begin by collecting samples and collecting metadata about those samples. Um, and so these samples could be um, basically whatever it is that you want to study. Um, and at this stage of your analysis, you are going to be doing things like assigning identifiers to your samples um, and compiling associated metadata. In this photo, I have, um, or sorry, in this slide, I have a photo of a swab that we sometimes use to collect human microbiome samples. Um, you can see there's two tips on that swab. Um, and what you would typically be doing with this is maybe, um, let's say you were interested in looking at a skin microbiome, say on the surface of somebody's hand, you would open this tube, you would swab that individual's hand, and then you would close the tube up. Um, and then in uh, maybe some sort of a spreadsheet program somewhere, you would take this label of your sample. So in this case, that label is 4AC2. Um, and you would record relevant information about that sample. And so in this case, you might say this was a skin sample that was collected from Greg on uh, April 1st, 2021. Um, you would then do this for all of your samples, compiling metadata as you go, probably getting these um, swabs into the freezer as you go. Um, and that would be your sample collection phase for the project. Um, now, one thing that I have noted on here is that you should choose your sample IDs carefully. Um, the IDs that I have listed here were generated with a program uh, called QualID. Um, and there's some very cool features of these that make them convenient for working with. Um, one of those features is that two sample identifiers are never within, um, say, just one substitution of one another. And so like, you wouldn't have 4AC2 and 4AC3. Uh, the reason for that is because when you're working with many samples and you're working with these in the field and you're working with them in the lab, uh, it's, it's possible and actually common to have transcription errors. And so where um, either you might um, mistake a two for a three, um, either due to sloppy writing or just because you uh, misread something. Um, and so what this does is it ensures that even if you have some transcription errors, you should still be able to identify um, what sample is associated with what metadata in your spreadsheet. Um, if you 
uh, instead um, had these that were one uh, uh, one substitution apart from each other. So you had maybe four AC2 and four AC3. If you had a sample um, where you couldn't tell which one it was, um, you might end up having to discard that sample or you might end up having to discard, in the worst case, both of those samples, 4AC2 and 4AC3. Um, and so uh, thinking about what your sample names or sample identifiers are going to be um, is worth some investment in the beginning of the project. Um, so after you have collected your samples, um, you would typically take them to the lab and extract DNA from those. Um, and then you would isolate uh, and amplify the ribosomal RNA from all of the samples um, if you're doing an amplicon survey. And so that is what um, the focus of these lectures will be, is um, studies of a single gene. And so we've talked a lot this semester about using the small subunit ribosomal RNA as a marker for different uh, organisms, microbial organisms. Um, and so if that is the type of survey that you're doing, you would do PCR to, again, isolate and amplify the ribosomal RNA. If you're doing a metagenomic survey um, where you are looking at all of the DNA present in an environment or, or trying to look at all of the DNA present in an environment, then you would skip that PCR step. Um, now, during the PCR for um, ribosomal RNA sequencing, we would typically add a per sample DNA barcode to the sequence. Um, and so if you imagine now that we have, say, those four samples from the previous, um, uh, previous slide, then we would, um, at the PCR stage, we add these short DNA barcodes. These are usually, um, in this case, they're seven bases long. More commonly, they are either eight or 12 bases long. Um, but what this is, it is a uh, unique DNA sequence. It's not necessarily a biological sequence, so it's not of biological origin, um, but it's a sequence that we create in the lab and that we append to each 16S ribosomal RNA sequence. Um, what that lets us do is it allows us to pool all of these amplicons together. And so amplicons would be the product of amplification um, and uh, sequence them in a single sequencing run. Now that's really important because the sequencing run is gonna generate either millions or billions of sequences um, and if, uh, uh, if you were not able to pool all of your samples together, it would be very expensive um, to do this, uh, do this type of analysis because you would have to do one of these runs, um, which might cost um, you know, anywhere from 1000 to, uh, say, $10,000, depending on what sequencing technology you're using. Um, and so that would be cost prohibitive um, if it were the cost per sample. But if you can pool, say, hundreds of samples um, in a single sequencing run, then that lets you do this um, very cost effectively. Um, so after um, pooling those amplicons, you would run them through a sequencing instrument. And the instrument that I have pictured here is one that's very commonly used in microbiome surveys. It's actually getting to be a, um, a bit old now, but this is an Illumina MySeq instrument that I have pictured here. Um, and when we run our, our amplicons through that, um, it will generate what we call FASTQ files. And we've come across FASTQ files once or twice this semester already. Um, our FASTQ files, um, like we've previously discussed, are going to have our sequences and then they have associated quality information. Um, and so this is quality information um, that is encoded in ASCII characters um, and it indicates the quality of each base. Um, this would be in one single file um, sometimes under some circumstances, this would be, um, there would be sequence data in two different files. Um, that would be if we were doing a single end run versus a paired end run. Um, and there will typically be a single barcodes file associated with this. 
and the barcodes file is going to be a separate read of the sequence barcodes that we added during barcoded PCR. Um, and so the way that this then works, um, well, I'll move on to the next slide for that. Um, but the way that this then works is that each barcode in the barcodes file is associated with a corresponding um, record in the sequences file. Uh, and so, uh, and these are in the same order in these two files. And so if you um, work through the barcodes file and the sequences file at the same time, you can look up your barcode in your sample metadata and that'll tell you what sample this particular sequence was observed in. This process of mapping sequences to the samples that they came from is called, uh, is called sequence demultiplexing. And so when we have our data in this format where, all the, where the sequences from all of the samples are in a single file, we would call that multiplex data or a multiplexed sequence file. Um, when we demultiplex that, um, and so in other words, when we take the sequences file, the barcodes file, and our sample metadata, um, and we separate the um, sequences into per sample sequence files. Um, and so for example, here you see I have a 4ac2.fastq file, and so that corresponds to one of my sample IDs here. Um, all of these sequences in this file would be from that 4ac2 sample. Um, I would have a um, E375 sample, and so I've got one of these samples, FASTQ file, or sorry, one of these FASTQ files per sample. And so now I would call this my demultiplex data. Um, and demultiplex data is um, where we uh, can start performing some of our next steps of the analysis. And so sequence demultiplexing is something that you can do with Chime 2, or it's something that can be done for you before you get your sequence data. And so depending on who does your sequencing and how they do it and how they process it, they may either give you multiplex sequence data or demultiplex sequence data. It doesn't really matter so much which one of these you start with um, as far as Chime is concerned. Um, okay, so the next step, once you have the demultiplex sequences, is that you would apply quality control to those sequences. And so this is where you would start looking at those sequence quality scores. Um, and you would define the features that you'll be working with in your analysis. Um, and so the features, um, remember, would be, um, uh, the features would be, um, in our case, they are going to be um, different 16S sequences that we observed in our samples. Um, and so the key uh, piece of data that we construct at this step is what we call our feature table. Um, and the feature table is something we talked about already in our machine learning section. Um, and we actually adopt the terminology that is used for um, machine learning for describing these tables. Um, and so in our feature table, our rows are gonna represent samples and our columns are gonna represent different features that we've observed in our data set. And so if we were to read across one of these columns, what this is, would tell us is that we observed feature one 42 times in sample 4AC2. We observed feature two zero times in sample 4AC2. Um, we observed feature one 12 times in sample E375. We observed feature two one time in sample E375, and so on. Um, the other key piece of data that is typically generated at this stage is a description of what those features are in terms of the sequence that they represent. Um, and so this uh, secondary file here, 
um, would be um, under the hood a FASTA file where the identifiers in that file are features um, and so, or sorry are feature IDs um, and so for example here we see feature one um, that has a corresponding entry in this feature data file and that is describing what sequence is associated with feature one Similarly, feature two will show up in there, feature three, four, and five. Um, all of the features that are defined in our feature table will show up in this corresponding feature data file. Um, now, the term feature is um, very purposefully generic because these features can be many different things. In an Amplicon survey, like what we're talking about here, they're going to be variants of the Amplicon that we have observed. And so these are going to be unique 16S sequences that we have observed in our survey. Um, we could do something, um, say, downstream of this. We could, for example, do a taxonomy assignment step, which I'll talk about next. Um, and we could then define a new feature table where instead of features, we might have microbial taxa or microbial genera, for example, as our feature identifiers. We can still do many of the same analyses with that data. We could do, for example, machine learning on it. Um, we could do uh, uh, some of the diversity metrics that we're going to learn how to compute in the next few lectures. Um, and so um, we purposefully call these fe um, features because they can be any number of different uh, uh, types of information about our samples. The types of features that we're working with here are what we would typically call Amplicon sequence variants. Uh, we often abbreviate that ASV. <clears throat> Um, so there are a few other steps that we can apply now that we have our feature table and this feature data. Um, one of those is doing taxonomic assignment of our feature sequences. Um, and so we talked about this um, throughout the semester. We talked about a few ways to do this. Um, one of those would be we could do something like a sequence alignment um, based database search. Um, we talked about using global pairwise alignment for that, and we looked at specifically how you could do that with um, Amplicon with 16S Amplicon sequence variants to assign bacterial or archaeal taxonomy to those sequences. We also talked about uh, doing that with a naive Bayes classifier in the corresponding um, or in the machine learning uh, chapter in the book. Um, and so Chime 2 allows you to use um, either of those approaches or a few other approaches um, for doing taxonomy assignment. The naive Bayes classifier, um, almost exactly as it's uh, described in the book, is the most common way that we do this. But uh, using something like a database search is also very common. Um, and so what we do um, with this is we've got some reference database. Um, that has sequences and taxonomy associated with those sequences and using either naive Bayes or an alignment based approach we compare the sequences that we observed in our analysis to our annotated reference sequences and we associate taxonomy with the features that we generated um, in our study. And so now, in addition to having this sequence data associated with our features, we could also have taxonomy data associated with our features. Um, another upstream processing step that we would often apply is building a phylogenetic tree from feature sequences. Now, unfortunately, we didn't really get to talk about building phylogenetic trees um, in our class this semester, um, but that's another very interesting topic in bioinformatics. There are a lot of um, very mature algorithms that are used for taking sequence data and building a phylogenetic tree. Um, but the basic idea here is that a phylogenetic tree 
is going to represent the evolutionary relationship between these sequences um, as determined by the algorithm that you're applying to it. Um, what you would typically do, the way these typically work, is that you would um, align all of the sequences that you're working with um, and instead of doing a pairwise alignment, you do what's known as a multiple sequence alignment. Um, and so this is also something we unfortunately didn't get to this semester, um, but it's um, a straightforward extension of the needle and wench um, algorithm. And so instead of aligning two sequences in this case, you would be aligning N sequences. Um, and so you align sequences, you apply some filtering to it, um, and then using one of uh, many different algorithms, you would build a phylogenetic tree that attempts to um, make branch lengths between features that are more similar or more, um, we suspect they're more closely related, shorter than, for example, branch lengths between more distantly related features. Um, and so you can imagine here that um, maybe, let me just go back one slide. Um, no, they don't really correspond too well. Um, but like you can imagine here that maybe um, these are all bacterial sequences and these are archaeal sequences. Um, and so the branch lengths between the bacterial sequences would be relatively short. Um, uh, and when I say relative, I mean relative to the branch length between, say, a bacterial sequence and an archaeal sequence. Um, we will come back a little bit later to why we would want to build a phylogenetic tree from these sequences. Um, but just to, um, just to give you a little bit of insight on this right now, um, we're not typically building a tree from this to, to gain a in-depth understanding of the evolutionary history of these organisms. The sequences that we're working with here tend to be too short to do that. Um, and those approaches tend to work better if you are aligning many genes rather than just working with a single gene. Um, the trees that we build here um, are really used just to give us a rough idea of how similar or dissimilar different features are in our data set. Um, and so um, this is a tree that you would use sort of internally for your microbiome analysis, but you would never really publish this tree as um, a good example or a good representation of the evolutionary history of the organisms that you're studying. Um, building a tree for that purpose um, uh, tends to take a lot more work. Okay, so at this stage, we have wrapped up what I think of as the upstream processing steps in a microbiome analysis workflow. Um, this results in a few data artifacts that are primarily what we'll end up using downstream of here when we start now trying to answer questions about these microbiome samples. Um, the uh, first two are our feature table. And so again, that has samples on one axis and features on the other axis. And each cell in this matrix indicates how many times each feature was observed in each sample. We also have our sample metadata, um, and this is something that you would have computed before, or sorry, compiled before uh, uh, starting your Chang2 analysis. Um, the other upstream data artifacts are information about our features. And so there's our phylogeny, which represents evolutionary relationships between our features. Um, there are our sequence data associated with each feature, and there's taxonomy data associated with each feature. Um, now, what I was noticing here is like this tree isn't as a very good representation of these features here 
Um, and so there's a little mismatch in my example that, oh, you know what, let me, I just realized these are out of order here. So one, no, still not. And I'm, what I'm noticing here is like feature one is annotated as proteobacteria. Feature two and feature, feature two is a bacteroidetes. Feature three is a proteobacteria. And there's a relatively short um, distance between those. Um, and so not really a great um, alignment between this tree and this data in this little toy data set that I've constructed for, for these examples. Maybe I'll go back and fix that in my slides. Um, okay, so now what I want to do is I want to start talking about some of the ways that we analyze microbiomes. And I'm going to begin this by talking about what we call metrics of alpha diversity. Um, and so alpha diversity is um, typically described as a within sample diversity. And so it's telling you about the diversity of a single sample. Um, the way that I think about this is that you can compute an alpha diversity metric just from data from like one vector in your feature table. Um, and so that would be like one single sample vector. And so we'll come back to that um, when we talk about, when we contrast this with beta diversity metrics. And so beta diversity metrics are computed from more than one vector in that matrix. And what we're going to talk about primarily in these lectures, um, or in this lecture, is community richness. Um, and so community richness is a, one of many measures of alpha diversity, um, and, or I should say it's a category of measure of alpha diversity. Um, and so richness tells us about how many different types of organisms are present in a given sample. Um, and I usually like to illustrate this with um, uh, representing it to some, uh, some types of organisms that we can actually see. Um, and so in these figures, we can see um, two different flower gardens. The flower garden on the left is very low richness. There's only one type of flower present here. Um, the flower garden on the right has many different types of flowers. Um, and so this on the left would be a low richness community, and this on the right would be a relatively higher richness community. Now, one thing that richness does not tell us is anything about the composition of the samples. Um, so you'll notice, for example, that these yellow tulips are present in both of our gardens. So we see them here and we see them here. Um, but this garden is much more rich. It has many other types of flowers in addition to the yellow tulips. Um, okay, so now when we relate this back to microbiomes, we would think of um, a microbiome sample that had relatively few different types of microorganisms in it um, as a low richness sample and a sample that had many different types of microorganisms in it as a higher richness sample. Um, and again, types of organisms or types of microorganisms is purposefully a generic term. Um, you could think of that again as like these features. Um, and so um, these could be, for example, species, these could be phyla, these could be amplicon sequence variants, um, or any other number of things. Regardless of what type of feature we're looking at, we can compute a measure of richness. So the simplest measure of community richness is a measure that, we, that I'll call here observed features. Um, you may hear this referred to other things, like maybe using less generic terms, like you may hear this referred to as observed species, um, but same idea. Um, it's going to be a count of the different features observed in a sample. Um, and so when we say observed here, um, what we mean is it is the features that have a count that is greater than zero. Um, and so I've highlighted in this slide 
the uh, features that have a count of greater than zero in each one of our samples. And so here you can see that feature one, feature two, and feature three each have a count of greater than zero. Four and five have zero counts. Uh, in sample two, or in sample E375, um, we have again three features that have non zero counts. They happen to be different features, partially overlapping with the features that we observe in sample four AC2. Um, but uh, again, just three of those. And so, oh, and I notice a typo here. I have uh, observed OTUs. Um, OTUs is another generic term uh, that stands for operational taxonomic units. Um, but for a few reasons, it's fallen out of fashion in, uh, in the microbiome literature. So I just went ahead and changed that to say observed features. Um, okay, so if we go ahead and count those, I think you can probably do this um, on your own. Um, and uh, what I indicate in this slide is that when we look at this feature table and we're computing something like, again, I'll call it observed features, um, we are sort of thinking of everything as being either present or absent. Um, and so we think it, we would call this a qualitative metric of diversity because we're not paying attention to the fact, for example, that these, um, say feature one was observed 25 times, we just care that it was observed or not observed. Um, and so when we compute that, I'll change that one more time here, um, we would see that we get a um, observed feature count of three for each one of these samples. Um, so pretty easy metric to compute. I think everybody can probably do that um, on their own pretty easily. Um, one thing again to note is that these two samples have an equal value for observed features. That Notice that that doesn't tell us anything about which specific features were observed here. So it's not telling us that the composition of these samples is different. It's just telling us that each one of them had three features observed. Um, so the next thing that I want to talk about here um, is something that is important to be aware of when you are computing these types of metrics of diversity of microbiomes. So take a look at this table for a minute and think about whether there's anything that concerns you about it. Um, what concerns me about this table is that it looks like we have much higher values for these first two samples than we have for the second two samples. Um, in fact, if we compute the um, total frequency, and so the total count, so basically sum the values across each of these rows, you can see that these are very different values from one another. And so in this first one, we have 358, 247, then 51, and 27. Um, and this is a problem because uh, diversity metrics are, um, can be uh, very heavily impacted by the total frequency. And so the way that um, I like to relate this back to the world that we can see is imagine that you were doing a survey of plant diversity um, and you wanted to compare the number of types of plants in say the Sonoran Desert and with a rainforest in Costa Rica. Now imagine you went out to the Sonoran Desert and you surveyed a square kilometer and so maybe with a team of uh, students you counted all of the different plants that were present in a square kilometer of the Sonoran Desert. Then imagine you went to the Costa Rican rainforest and you surveyed all of the plants that were present, but this time maybe you were feeling lazy 
Um, and so you just did this in 10 square meters. Now, you shouldn't be surprised if you come to the conclusion that there are more types of sample, or sorry, more types of plants in the Sonoran Desert where you surveyed a square kilometer than in the rainforest where you got lazy and only surveyed 10 square meters. That's because you expended a lot more effort looking for plants in the desert than you did in the rainforest, and so you shouldn't be surprised that you found more. Um, now, in a microbiome survey that is based on sequences, the total number of sequences that we obtain is uh, the analog of our sampling effort. Um, the total frequency that you get from a sample typically doesn't represent any, any relevant information about that sample. So it's not, for example, um, indicative of fewer microbial cells in that sample. Because remember, there is a PCR step um, in this workflow. And so we've amplified the DNA from all of these samples. And so we've probably washed out um, that signal on the total number of different cell types. Um, and so these differences that we observe in total frequency are a artifact of the sequencing technology that we're using. Um, and so they don't actually tell us anything. Um, and if we have a total frequency that is higher in some samples than others, we shouldn't be surprised if that tells us that there are more types of features in that sample because, again, we have expended a greater effort looking at those samples. Um, and so the way that we typically handle this um, currently is we apply a process that is known as rarefaction. Um, and this is, I like to think of this as a necessary evil. Um, there are some newer approaches, better approaches being developed, um, and hopefully before too long, we will get away from the need to do this rarefaction process. Um, but what you're doing when you rarefy a feature table or apply rarefaction to a feature table is you perform subsampling of the counts that you have observed such that each of your samples will have an uh, equal total frequency. Um, and so, for example, in this, uh, 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 in this table, what I've done is I have applied rarefaction to get to an even sampling depth of 51 sequences per sample. Um, if we go back to our previous slide, you can see that one of our samples had 51 sequences, these two had more, this one down here had less. Um, and so when we apply this random sampling step, um, all of our samples will end up having whatever depth we specify. And so in this case, 51. Um, and any samples that have a lower total frequency than that will be excluded from any analyses downstream. So if we can't achieve the desired sampling depth for a sample, we will throw away that sample. Now we should be able to get a more accurate um, relative measure of alpha diversity across our samples um, or of beta diversity across our samples. Um, we will come back, like I said, to beta diversity later. Okay, so next I want to talk about another metric of community richness um, that deals with a limitation of, uh, of simple feature counting um, that we're going to touch on next and that is going to make use of some of the other data that we computed upstream. Now, before we do that, I want to mention that Although it's simplistic, feature counting is very commonly used. It's one of the most widely used measures of microbiome richness. Um, and so even with as simple as it is, it is something that we use all the time. This and the next metric I'm gonna talk about are things that you would apply 
after rarefaction. Okay, so now I have a um, better uh, taxonomy information uh, set uh, data set in here now um, that more closely aligns with the phylogeny. And so imagine we again have these two samples, 4AC2 and E375. Um, and we um, previously computed our observed features on those two uh, samples. We found that they were equally rich, um, but now imagine that we have some additional information about those samples. Um, so imagine we also have this phylogenetic tree and we have the taxonomy. Now take a minute here and let me know if you notice anything um, jumping out about this. So what you might notice here is that while these do have the same number of features, the second sample here contains features that are both in the uh, bacterial domain and in the archaeal domain. So the second sample has feature four, which is annotated as an archaea. Um, sample 4AC2 only has samples, or sorry, only has features one, two, and three, only bacterial. Uh, features. And so you may um, start to think that the count, simple counting of features is not a very good representation of the actual diversity of this sample, um, especially if you think about, for example, the functional diversity. Um, and so if the um, uh, if, for example, the nutrient needs of a sam of uh, you know these different organisms are different because they're so um, so evolutionary diverged from one another, um, that might be a representation of a more diverse sample. Um, similarly, if you think about like waste products that these um, these communities are generating. Uh, you might have a higher diversity of products that are being generated by the second sample than the first one because the biology of these organisms that are present are so different across these samples. And so another metric of richness that is often used um, tries to capture the evolutionary relationship between the features. Um, and the primary metric that we use for that, for community richness, is a metric called Faith's phylogenetic diversity. And what Faith's phylogenetic diversity does is instead of just counting the features that are observed, it counts the branch length that is covered in a phylogenetic tree representing those features. Um, and so for this first sample, <clears throat> what you would do to compute Faith's phylogenetic diversity is you would say outline. Um, I would typically start with the features that are observed. So here we observe features one, two, and three, and go ahead and outline all of the branch length in this phylogenetic tree, going back to the root of the tree, which is this branch over here. Um, really, it's actually, it would be a node in the tree. Um, but we're representing it here with a branch um, just so it's a little bit, it pops out a little bit easier. Um, and if you sum these values, you would end up with the phylogenetic diversity of the sample. Um, and so in this case, you would end up with a Faith's phylogenetic diversity or Faith's PD of 3.35. Now, if you did this for your second sample, um, and so again, start with your features, go all the way back to the root of the tree and outline which branches are represented in that sample, you could again sum those up and you would end up with a larger value of Faith's PD. In this case, you would end up with 5.05. .05. <clears throat> 
I would encourage you to take this tree and this um, feature table that we looked at a few slides back, um, say either this one or this one, um, and compute some Faith's PD values and make sure that you're getting those right. You can also look at an example in the corresponding book chapter where those are computed. Um, and so you can actually do some experiments with the phylogenetic tree and with the feature table and you can compute, um, you can make sure that you understand how to compute Faith's phylogenetic diversity. Um, okay, so these are two different metrics. Of, oh, sorry, and the other thing that I wanted to mention here is you'll notice now that we've computed these, what we find is that this second sample, E357, is a uh, indicated as a more rich sample than sample 4AC2. And so that corresponds with our expectations based on what I talked about a few minutes ago about um, this potentially being a more diverse sample because it represents more diverse organisms. Um, and so depending on what you're trying to do, what questions you're trying to answer, about your microbiomes, you might use the observed features metric, or you might use Faith's phylogenetic diversity, or you might use um, any of a num number of other metrics of alpha diversity. Um, okay, so to sum up here, um, typically what you would end up doing with this after you have computed these values um, is you would do some type of a comparison of the alpha diversity across your samples. Um, that might be something like a distribution plot. And so over here, I'm looking at some box plots where um, say we are looking at two different genotypes. Um, and so these in this example are gut microbiome samples from uh, mice some of which are susceptible to a disease, genetically susceptible to a disease, and others of which have a wild type genotype. Um, and you can compare, for example, Faith's phylogenetic diversity across these two sample categories. Um, and so the sample categories would group different samples together based on the metadata in a metadata spreadsheet. Um, so you could compare these visually um, doing something like these distribution plots. Um, you could statistically compare these with something like a Kruskal-Wallis test. Um, or if you were comparing this to um, a continuous variable, so like imagine you, these are soil samples and you're looking at soil pH versus community richness, you might do that with something like a scatter plot. Um, and so you could have pH on one axis and face phylogenetic diversity on the other axis, and you could compute something like a Spearman correlation to try and identify whether there is a statistically significant relationship between those samples. Okay, so that's where I'm going to leave off for today. Um, make sure that you do the reading that corresponds to this lecture as I dive into some of these ideas in a little bit more detail there. Um, when we come back next time, we will start talking about um, another category of diversity metrics called beta diversity metrics. See you next time.